Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to, to come and speak at this new network. I think it's really important that we see new networks in this area emerge around Europe. There aren't enough of them. Okay, so this paper um, is hopefully going to be part of a special issue of the Journal of Sociology, which is the Australian Sociological Association's uh, journal. And that will hopefully be coming out at the end of the year. Although it's not past review yet, so I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping it will pass review. <laughs> uh, but also that means if you want an extended copy of the written paper uh, after today, then just send me an email and I can also share the uh, PowerPoint with you as well. Okay. Okay, uh, I wouldn't normally put such a large quote on a PowerPoint slide, but um, I've been reading a lot of uh, climate change books recently, and uh, Amitav Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, I don't know if anybody here has read it, uh, but it's certainly uh, one of the best uh, books that I've read uh, about climate change. He, he, is a, he is an author, as you, you might know, but he also writes um, nonfiction as well, and I suppose, you know, it depends how we categorize these things, but this is more like one of his uh, nonfiction books. And I think it's a really important reflection on uh, climate change. Although he's not a social scientist, he's coming from, yeah, he's, he's talking about more the arts and literature. So uh, this quote, and I will just drink some water before uh, reading through it. So he says, in a substantially altered world, when sea level rise has swallowed the Sundarbans and made cities like Kolkata, New York, and Bangkok uninhabitable, when readers and museum goers turn to the art and literature of our time, will they not look first and foremost, first and most urgently, for traces and portents of the altered world of their inheritance? And when they fail to find them, what should they, what can they do, other than to conclude that ours was a time when most forms of art and literature were drawn into the modes of concealment that prevented people from recognizing the realities of their plight? Quite possibly then, this era which so congratulates itself on its self-awareness will come to be known as the time of the great derangement. Hence is the title of his book. So obviously he's talking about art and literature. That's his most direct interest. And he is um, saying that they are largely ignoring climate change. There's a lack of representation of climate change, you know, wi with exceptions. And he does discuss uh, exceptions as well. And in doing so, in, in, in creating that uh, absence, uh, they are, they are co contributing to uh, a kind of concealment, a kind of uh, derangement. And so I wonder um, today in this talk whether I can reflect this back to my own discipline, which is sociology and the social sciences generally, and to reflect on whether uh, the social sciences are doing something similar. There are arguments for and uh, arguments against, so, so we'll, uh, we'll have a look at those. So what are the social sciences and specifically of uh, sociology? Well, as many of you will know, uh, we've had uh, a sub-area of environmental sociology which emerged actually in the late 1970s. Um, I would say that it, it, it hasn't really um, majorly influenced the discipline as a whole. Uh, it should have filtered through and shaped the entire discipline, but it has not. Uh, if you know sociology, it's, uh, it's prone to chronic uh, sub-disciplinization. So we have the sociology of this, the sociology of that, and everybody disappears into their own silos and doesn't talk to each other. It's, it's, it's not good. So hopefully another thing I want to do today is to point to some of the connections and important connections between uh, various sub-disciplines of sociology, most obviously uh, environmental sociology and the sociology of human-animal relations. And even within environmental sociology, we see a further sub-disciplinization with the emergence in the last decade of the sociology of climate change as a specific uh, part of environmental so sociology and overlapping into other areas of sociology, obviously. So maybe, um, taking uh, Gauche's uh, pessimism, I suppose, isn't perhaps quite as reflected in, in the social sciences. After all, we have this substantial area of uh, scholarship um, within the social sciences. It's also worth um, saying at this point that in the broader context, uh, clearly, we need to remember that the, na the natural sciences 
dominate uh, climate change discourse and uh, the social sciences of climate change don't really get much influence in terms of shaping policy. And I think this is rather unfortunate, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's for a reason, because uh, uh, climate natural scientists are very good at describing um, and measuring what is going on uh, with uh, climate change, but they're perhaps not so adept at uh, explaining why climate change has emerged. And of course, when you do that, it makes climate change, it politicizes it more, and uh, perhaps that doesn't translate into uh, policy for various uh, conflicts of interest. And what about the sociology of animals as, a, as another sub-discipline? So it actually has a, a similar timeline in, uh, in in comparison with environmental sociology. So it also first emerged in the late 1970s and early 1980s, although I would say it's been somewhat less successful than environmental sociology, um, and I'm measuring success here in terms of uh, research outputs and also the professionalization of it uh, within the uh, discipline as a whole, although it has had some uh, successes in terms of, for example, the uh, some representation at BSA, uh, sorry, BSA being the British Sociological Association uh, conferences, and also uh, the uh, American Sociological Asso Association does also have a, a human animal um, interest group in it as well. And so both both subdisciplines, environmental sociology and uh, sociology of human animal relations, have contested normative ontologies in sociology, and most notably, um, for example, the idea that. Uh, uh, we, the sociologists should no longer conflate the social with the human. So the social should come to include um, non-human animals and our interactions uh, with them. But environmental sociologists, unfortunately, have tended to ignore animals. And again, this is part of the problem of this um, process of sub-disciplinization. And uh, a couple of premises of my uh, presentation today are, number one, we can see evidence of this ignoring of animals also in the sociology of climate change. Okay, so one thing I'm going to do is survey some key texts from the sociology of climate change and show to you the lack of uh, scholarship, the lack of inclusion of uh, human-animal relations within the sociology of climate change. And uh, premise number two is that this exclusion literally makes no sense. Uh, because I don't think you can properly theorize climate change without including human-animal relations. And that is the one sentence I want to say to all environmental sociologists. You cannot properly theorize climate change without including human-animal relations. Okay. Okay, so a little overview of where I'm going. So, as I just mentioned, I'll, I'll begin with a survey of sociology of climate change texts. I'm just using the SCC uh, abbreviation for sociology of climate change. And then I want to obviously make an argument for the animalization of the sociology of climate change. And I'll do this with a couple of case studies. Okay, so case study one, the animal industrial complex, specifically animal agriculture, not surprisingly. And case two, I'm going to look at some insects as well as good examples for why um, a sociology of climate change should be um, bringing in um, animal species into its uh, consideration. And then finally, I'll just uh, end on some concluding reflections. Okay. How do you have time? Great. So, when I was writing this paper, I wanted to um, create a sample of texts which I thought were good, a good representation of the sociology of climate change. It's, it's an area which has essentially emerged um, during the last 10 years with some um, input before that from uh, environmental sociology generally, but, but now specifically sociologists have started to take on the question of climate change. Okay, you may recognize some of these books. Some are more famous than others, so, and some have more famous authors than others. So, for example, Bruno Latour, very well known, Anthony Giddens, uh, John Uri, and you know, um, I want to say something about the rationale, also uh, for my choice of texts as well. 
But what I did in uh, reading through these uh, texts was to look for evidence of uh, human-animal relations in their argument in various ways. So, uh, number one, uh, the extent to whether these books factor human-animal relations into their analysis of what climate change is. Uh, their understanding of what practices have shaped climate change, how the impacts of climate change are framed, and what practices might help to address climate change. So is there, for example, discussion on transitioning to new diets and so on, and that kind of thing. Okay. Okay, so for, uh, before I present um, some the results of this uh, survey, I'll say something more about the methodology for choosing this, um, this set of um, 12 texts. Okay, so I, uh, I came up with a small sample of about seven, and then um, to, to garner further suggestions and to try to improve the uh, robustness of my sample, I saw input uh, at, the, at the start of this year from fellow subscribers to the Climate Change Study Group uh, email list of the British Sociological Association, uh, which has been around since, uh, I think, 2010. I've been a member of it since, it since it began. But it seemed like a good place to go to for opinion. Uh, like if, if you were constructing a sample of texts for the uh, sociology of climate change, which would you include? Now, obviously, the sample c does contain a degree of uh, arbitrariness. Uh, however, at the same time, I think it is fair to say that most of these texts would be agreed upon for inclusion by most uh, knowledgeable researchers uh, in the field. Uh, it's worth also saying that the sample is limited in the sense of being, uh, in terms of the authors, it's uh, disproportionately white, male, and Western, which is, is definitely a current reflection of the subfield of the sociology of climate change. For example, only 3 out of 12 or 25% of lead authors are women, and they are all white. And so this might be significant to bear in mind because uh, many authors increasingly say that climate change is a gendered uh, phenomenon, and I would agree with this, and also that climate change is bound up in colonialism. It may also be significant, significant given that the social construction of uh, hegemonic masculinity tends to disavow the moral considerability of non-human animals, which could make it more likely for men, more generally, to have something of a conceptual blind spot regarding the inclusion of, inclusion of animals in their analysis of climate change. So I think you know, we need to bear these questions in mind as we, as we go through um, a survey of these texts. Okay, that's a really quick way to represent the results. <laughs> so out of the 12, out of the 12 books, only two have significant discussion of human animal relations. The ones with the question marks, well, for example, these two, these are volumes, so they're huge books and they have many, many authors. And so you would think they have more scope for, for inclusion because there's much more diversity, you would hope, in, in the auth authorship. And they do have some mentions, but no, no single chapter in either of these two volumes is devoted to human-animal relations. There are just like snippets of mentions every now and again. Uh, Bruno Latour, well, he's an interesting person in this debate, and I'll come back to him a little bit later. But all the texts with X's had no substantial mention or no mention at all of human-animal relations um, in, in their content. Now, obviously, I'm going to be critical about this, but I also want to say that these 12 books are also very insightful books, and I would recommend them to anybody who wants to gain some knowledge of uh, sociological approaches to climate change. Um, you know, I think that they're, they're, they are required reading, so my, my criticism is, is partial. But I will go through um, some uh, examples of... Um, the kind of material we find uh, in them. Okay, so I'm saying that two got ticks. So two texts of the 12 stood out in the regard of including a reference to human-animal relations. First of all, uh, the Adams text, which is the, um, the first one here, which is 
some people may argue this is more social psychology, but you know that's another debate. Um, so Adams uh, is a broad-reaching text which also overlaps with uh, critical psychology, psychosocial approaches to climate change, and there is another subdiscipline of the psychology of climate change, by the way. Um, and it conveys a critique of anthropocentrism and it is embedded within important key areas, including the discussions of posthumanism, uh, animal studies, it also mentions ecofeminism as well. The text reflects upon the issue of valuing the more than human as well as devoting some discussion actually to birds uh, within the context of climate change as well, and also challenging taken for granted uh, human animal relations. In this way, the text is both ontologically sensitive to the foregrounding of other animals in social science approaches to climate change and reflexive to the role of changing dominant human-animal relations as a part response to uh, climate change. Now, the second, the second uh, tick text is by Julie Doyle, Mediating Climate Change, so, uh, coming from a uh, sociology of media, media perspective. And uh, she devotes an entire chapter to the topic of meat and dairy consumption. And this analyzes how different campaign groups frame sustainable consumption in relation to meat and dairy. And uh, in a nuanced approach, Doyle is critical of campaigns which reinforce dominant consumerist framings of action focused on the individual, and those which focus also on more structural regulatory approaches without questioning the commodification of animals. So the text acknowledges the contribution of uh, global meat and dairy production to greenhouse gas emissions, and it quotes um, uh, a figure of 18% in terms of the uh, overall contribution of meat and dairy production to climate change in terms of overall emissions. I'll come back to the politics of these figures a little bit later. And that 18% that figure, as many of you will know, comes from the uh, FAO um, report Livestock's Long Shadow from 2006. Uh, moreover, the text outlines the reluctance of governments to act on this dimension of climate change and cites well-known texts from critical animal studies. Um, and as Doyle makes clear, changing food practices also involves questioning dominant symbolic meanings around meat and dairy consumption, since meat and dairy consumption have been so symbolically important for um, large numbers of people. So after this kind of limited, well, you know, after the successes of, the, of these, of these two books, it becomes a lot uh, sparser in the in the remaining ten. Um, I've mentioned that the volumes don't really um, have any specific chapters devoted to the topic, but they do have some chapters which mention um, mention the issue in various ways. Um, and then there's a third volume as well, which is the one by Elizabeth Shove and um, Nicholas Sperling which is on uh, practice theory. So some of you might, might know about practice theory approaches to sustainable transition. It's something that I've uh, been influenced by in my work on veganism. Um, but again, there's really not much. Um, if anything, there's a very brief mention of vegetarianism in the book, but there's really not, uh, not anything in the book about uh, human-animal relations. Okay. So then we get onto some books which focus on uh, climate change and capitalism, which, is, which you might expect from social scientists. Uh, uh, obviously, the uh, analysis of capitalism has been uh, at the heart of sociology since its beginning, and so it's not a surprise that sociologists would have something to say about climate change and capitalism. So we have the, bu the book by um, Goff, top right, and then we also have the, uh, the Max Koch book, um, Capitalism and Climate Change at the bottom left there as well. So Goff contains a few cursory mentions of meat consumption. Uh, Koch doesn't, has no mentions at all. Um, then we have an interesting book by Norgard um, on uh, climate change emotions in everyday life. But again, there's no, there's no, um, no material pertaining to human animal relations. Uh, Shaw uh, is a really interesting book on this, how the social construction of the two degree C um, limit in climate change uh, policy discourse has come about, um, although he does have some brief mentions of threats to animal extinction, he does not mention um, significantly aspects of human-animal relations. And so the sample finishes with works from three well-known sociologists, Latour, Giddens and uh, John Uri. Those of you who have done some work in, the, in science studies will know that Latour has an intellectual history of considering the agency of the more than human, which is reflected in this recent text, which is basically uh, a series of lectures that he gave in Edinburgh a few years ago. 
um, taken together and, and put into a text. So the text, for example, does include an, in, an interesting discussion on theorizing non-state and non-human delegations that have interests in relation to a changing climate. So uh, that is interesting in the sense of affording agency to, to the more than human. And also, uh, briefly, in a very passing uh, moment on page 254, uh, briefly affords a causal role to meat consumption in terms of climate change. However, despite this ontological affinity, the text is surprisingly exclusionary of discussion of human-animal relations, which uh, his focus really in the book is, is working with this concept of Gaia that he's, um, that he's trying to um, promote. Uh, Giddens, um, Anthony Giddens, anybody who takes introductory sociology tends to end up reading books by Anthony Giddens. Uh, any fans of third way politics and Tony Blair are also familiar with Anthony Giddens. Um, and interestingly, in 2009, he wrote this book about climate change. Um, there's not really much, much in it for um, those of us interested in human-animal relations, he makes brief reference to meat and emissions, and he also makes some reference of the poleward, poleward shifts seen in some animal and plant species linked to climate change. This is the idea that because of the changing climate, some plant and animal species are, are moving uh, further uh, towards the poles um, because of the uh, changing temperatures and so on. Um, he also makes a brief reference to vegetarianism, but only in the context of a discussion on eco-fascism. Um, apart from the, uh, then moving on to uh, John Uri, um, former colleague of mine and sadly passed away um, last year, I think. Um, apart from a few references to impacts on uh, human and, uh, and animal life, um, Uri's text, Climate Change and Society, makes no reference to uh, human-animal relations at all. Okay, so that takes us through, in a in, in a fast way, uh, a survey of the of the results of these twelve texts. Okay, so why is this disappointing? Well, I think there are at least four ways in which this exclusion is difficult to defend. So these are things that most of you will be familiar with. So agricultural human-animal relations make a significant contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. There's a, there's a politics over how much. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, in other words, the large-scale commodification of animals has changed ecosystems and is part of the complex causation of anthropogenic climate change. Secondly, the impacts of climate change are already also affecting the lives of other animals through various ways, through actual extinction. We have lost some species uh, due to climate change um, and also through threats to habitat. Uh, mismatch, which is uh, the term that ecologists give to um, a mismatch between uh, seasonal changes and the availability of um, foods to particular species. When that begins to change, then it threatens the, the um, sustainability of a particular species. And also, when we think about climate-related disasters, if we're willing to say that, for example, um, the increased propensity and strength of things like hurricanes are related to climate change, then obviously it's not only affecting humans, it's also affecting non-human animals as well. And unless we make this clear, we represent climate change falsely as only affecting humans. And in doing so, we, we reinforce the very anthropocentrism that should be under question. Thirdly, the unintended or unknown consequences of these impacts on other animals also then generate new human-animal relationalities, which shape new human-animal socialities and threats to human and animal welfare. So this is a complex area which um, sociologists, I think, should be uh, taking account of and should be doing interdis interdisciplinary work with ecologists, for example. So failure to make clear these ontological interdependencies is not only poor social science, it can also have real effects. So examples include the impact of climate change on agriculture and how that may affect food security uh, in the future, and also impacts on insect life, which I'm going to come back to uh, a little bit later. So they have a consequent shaping of patterns of disease transmission, which I will return to. So this is what I mean by how these uh, unintended or unknown consequences themselves generate new, potentially new human-animal relationalities. Suddenly we might have, for example, uh, insects in Northern Europe that we, you know, we, we didn't have in the past, and they, they may be um, 
uh, vectors of particular diseases, for example. So finally, if a sociology of climate change is to be useful to its publics, and this is something that sociology tries to be, it tries to be useful, it tries to uh, be applied, as it is trying to be with, for example, uh, in the whole uh, area of sustainable transition related research, it is trying to be, uh, the sociology of climate change is trying to be useful, then it needs to research and advocate for alternative forms of human-animal relations that do not contribute to, or certainly contribute far less, to greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. And overall, if animals tend to be absent from uh, the analysis, then this clearly impacts uh, the kind of mitigation approaches which are advocated for by, by the resulting uh, social science. Okay. So I'm going to move on to say uh, a little bit about uh, a couple of case studies. And the first one I think will be uh, far more familiar to all of you. And is the simple rec recollection really that uh, global animal agriculture, or what we might call the animal industrial complex, come back to that um, term in a moment, is a significant part of global capitalism. And it's not surprising that many uh, sociological perspectives on climate change point to the emergence of capitalist modernity as crucial to understanding climate change. It's one antidote to the fetishization of symbols and signifiers in climate change debate like CO2. So this is a point that's been made um, by uh, Eric Swingadao, for example, that he says that we, um, we tend to fetishize things like CO2 or we fetishize the two degrees C limit without thinking about the relations behind these numbers which are actually contributing to the phenomena. And so it's not surprising then that social scientists would want to talk about the economic relations behind which generate these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously Marxism is clearly part of the sociological uh, disciplinary identity, the critique of capitalism and so on. But what is perplexing, however, is the exclusion of human-animal relations, or, or what critical animal studies scholars call the animal industrial complex. Uh, I defined this in a 2012 paper as uh, a partly opaque and multiple set of networks and relationships between the corporate sector, governments, and public and private science. With economic, cultural, social, and effective dimensions, it, uh, it encompasses an extensive range of practices technologies, images, identities, and markets. So you can explore that paper. The original coining of the term comes from Barbara Noska, an anthropologist. And uh, what I'm saying is perplexing here is that sociological uh, treatments of capitalism, especially when discussed in relation to climate change, uh, it's, it's perplexing that they would exclude this animal industrial complex from their understandings of what capitalism is. And I think this is quite a feat um, when we think of the uh, animal production side of the animal industrial complex. It's a global industry responsible for 27% of all land use on the planet and is somehow forgotten from typical understandings of global capitalism. That's a very um, neat trick to, to pull off. Um, and just to uh, say something about the images on the slide, um, I guess you've all read Fossil Capital. He's Swedish, right? Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Mom, Andreas Mom. Um, it's, a, it's a great book. I like it a lot. It's, uh, it, it's a social history of um, climate change and, and uh, shows that um, the transition to um, using coal in the, uh, initially in the uh, British Industrial Revolution was... Um, was class-based and was um, obviously important for um, kick-starting the initial uh, rise in greenhouse gas emissions in the um, 18th and 19th centuries. But it's only part of the story. And so the reason I put a picture there of uh, Upton Sinclair's famous book, The Jungle, which came out in the early part of the 20th century, is that if you wanted a um, a more holistic picture of the emergences of climate change, then you would have to include something like Upton Sinclair's book, which was about the, uh, the formation of the uh, Chicago stockyards and the industrialization of animal production as well, if you wanted to have a fuller picture 
of where climate change has come from. And you'd also have to have uh, analysis of the historical analysis of the uh, um, increase in infrastructures around uh, the automobile and uh, uh, plane travel and so on. Okay. Right, so let me just say something about the animal industrial complex and climate change and just to give some stats which, which communicate something about its scale. Okay? So over the past 50 years, global meat production has more than quadrupled from 78 million tons. The, the FAO measures it in tons, so it's, uh, it's not even in individual animals, it's in, in the weight of, uh, of meat. So 78 million tons in 1963 to a total of 314 million tons per year in 2014. And then there's this forecast. Um, forecasting is an interesting practice in itself. Uh, the production will increase further to 455 million tons by 2050. And if we're always hearing that with climate change we can't have um, business as usual, then we need to understand obviously that this is not business as usual and it's not merely reflecting projected um, population changes either. It's, it's an excess of that. So we can see that, for example, in 1960, world human population reached 3 billion. In 2011, it reached 7 billion. So if you extrapolate the stats and, ma and uh, map them onto each other, you can see that the, uh, the, the rate of increase, the, the acceleration of the increase of meat production exceeds uh, that of the population increase, and so the meatification of diets has uh, been a particularly economic, uh, political economic process, and it's not something that can simply be uh, interpreted as a, as a natural reflection of population increase. Okay, and so the animal industrial complex is a significant part of capitalism overall. And I'm just taking a stat from uh, my country, the UK. In 2014, meat and dairy production was worth 12.6 billion. It's l I think it's a lot of money in terms of um, overall uh, GDP and so on. Uh, and then we know uh, roughly every year over 70 billion land animals are killed for human consumption. That's over 1 billion in the UK and 9 billion in the EU. And so, you know, th these are significant economic operations. And the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions from animal agriculture is a contested debate. Um, there are three reports which uh, commonly get quoted, and I'll mention them on the next slide. But the lowest estimated figure is 14.5% uh, of all emissions coming from this sector, or one in seven of all emissions coming from animal agriculture. And I personally think it's probably prudent to go with the lowest estimate, even if I don't necessarily think it's a reliable figure. And this, this slide, I'm not going to go into in huge detail, but it's uh, basically explaining um, some of that debate over the figure and these three reports, two, two coming from the um, FAO and one coming from the um, World Watch Institute in uh, Washington, D.C which had a very high figure, which uh, most people don't, don't believe. Um, so I think you know, erring on the side of caution is probably good, but there's also a need to recognize that, that this is a very political debate and uh, that it's likely that we don't have a reliable figure overall. And the rest of the slide is just saying um, some of the ways, in if you don't understand these processes, these are some of the ways in which uh, animal agriculture does contribute to um, increased uh, emissions. Okay. And I, I find this, this uh, infographic quite useful for thinking about um, animal production in terms of uh, global land use. So uh, it's using, it's not obviously not saying that all livestock production happens in North and South America, but it's using that um, symbolically to, to visualize that it's 27% of uh, land which is uh, used on the planet to um, produce, including um, grazing and feed crops as well, which is obviously a significant area of land. Okay. Okay. So what are the implications uh, for the sociology of climate change? So. The sociology of climate change is already performing quite a good job of contesting high carbon social norms. Okay, so it's uh, there's a lot of research into energy demand and how that might be uh, reduced, that we might change our practices so that we don't actually use as much energy. 
Um, and also there is some work on automobile use, but perhaps not quite as much. Um, but for example, there was an interesting, uh, interesting car book there by Dennis and Uri called After the Car, which is worth um, checking out. But I would say to be consistent and to reflect a broader understanding of the practices and relations which underline climate change, that would entail also that the sociology of climate change should adopt a critical dis disposition towards the animal industrial complex, uh, a more critical interrogation of what Potts called meat culture as part of uh, a sociology of climate change. And I would say that this would be wholly complementary to the familiar sociological territory of contesting social norms. It's what social scientists supposedly do well. And also in terms of envisaging alternative societies and also, for example, by implication, envisaging uh, alternative food cultures as well. A lot of the change is actually happening without sociologists realizing that actually food cultures are changing, as, as you may well know. So we might ask why this social norm has been left rather untouched by most sociologists. Um, why have they been happy to talk about energy and transport, but less happy to talk about um, food and, and the whole meat question? Well, I don't know, but it, it could be that um, the discipline of sociology itself is, is something of a product of humanism, and uh, it, uh, the maybe, it may be something about the identity of, of the discipline which uh, precludes a willingness to um, open up these social norms for uh, examination. Okay. So in other words, the, the sociology of climate change and the sociology of human-animal relations and critical animal studies really must intersect to improve the sociological analysis of climate change. So I mentioned the, on the previous slide this, um, this book in 2016, um, this critical book on meat culture edited by Annie Potts. Um, Helena has a chapter in, in that book. Uh, I have a chapter in that book as well. And some of the work that I've been doing around veganism, uh, I was happy to get a paper in, in the Soci journal Sociology on, on veganism, which is the first time they've ever published anything on veganism. And in that work, I'm, I'm completely framing a vegan transition in terms of uh, environmental sociology. So I'm trying to kind of bring, I'm trying to do the work of bringing these areas uh, closer together. Okay. okay, let's check how we're doing for time. Great. So second case study, insects. So I think uh, one thing that um, sociologists of climate change could do would be to um, start talking about insects, which might, might sound like a strange suggestion, but uh, I think there are good reasons uh, for that. So certain human-insect relations also constitute good arguments for the, for the inclusion of human-animal relations in the sociology of climate change. And specifically, climate change is thought to be extending the range at which insects' uh, vectors, the term which is used for insects which uh, carry diseases, which uh, can infect um, other animals, including uh, humans, um, such as ticks and mosquitoes, and, and the, so the ranges that they travel. So there's all sorts of interesting res research to show that um, the ranges of certain species of mosquito and certain species of ticks has extended into, for example, France and the UK and other, other European countries as well. Obviously, the, the, the term vectors is, a, is an interesting um, term to use from a critical animal studies perspective, and it's clearly it's quite instrumentalizing. Uh, I, say, I say a little bit more about that in the, in the written paper version. Um, so apprehending and understanding how climate change will affect the insect vectors of human pathogens is of paramount importance to, to health provision around the world. For example, as Chavez reminds us, vector-borne diseases account for 17% of the total burden of infectious diseases affecting humans. And uh, climate change has the capacity to introduce this risk to countries generally lacking the experience and the infrastructure to cope with uh, these sorts of diseases as well. So that has, that has a huge, potentially huge and considerable impact for uh, societies. And it also means, again, that uh, another subdiscipline of sociology is the sociology of health and illness. And it's another reason for 
having a close relationship between environmental sociology, uh, the sociology of human-animal relations, and the sociology of uh, health and illness, too. Okay. So for, for this work, I've been reading a lot of um, ecologists' work on, on uh, insects. It's pretty interesting how uh, this book here, Global Climate Change and Terrestrial Invertebrates, uh, is full of interesting uh, science on, on the subject. And one thing I noticed in, in reading this work is that uh, they're actually already thinking in, in, a, in a more impressively interdisciplinary way than, uh, than sociologists are. So ecologists are well aware that rates of transmission also depend heavily on human practices. I was reading, for example, that um, the, the uh, imp uh, impact of tire imports, uh, tires from trucks and cars, uh, the, the uh, insects can actually uh, live in these tires, and uh, the, so the economic practice of, of importing tires can actually um, increase the spread of uh, and, and range of, of certain insects, which is something I didn't know about before. Um, Parham argued that it is important to view climate-driven disease systems as complex socio-ecological dynamical systems. So they're already sort of trying to use language which is going beyond the traditional uh, dualistic frames. And so we already see shifting transmission rates across many uh, European countries, and we see novel insect visitors to uh, particular countries. And um, this has obviously yeah, a consequence for advising preventative behavior, and the training of health professionals, and that point I've already just made. Okay. So what are the impacts of this second case study for uh, the sociology of climate change? Well, it's obviously, an, and it's amazing to actually have to say this again, because it's a sort of thing that's been said for a long time now, but it's necessarily, necessary to let go of modernist ontologies, which define the social as a human space. Uh, Climate change as a phenomenon doesn't do human-animal dualism. Impacts on humans are also impacts upon animals and uh, vice versa. And uh, interdisciplinary literacy is, is this, you know, we can't avoid that, we, ne we need it. Okay. And attending to human-animal relations in the sociology of climate change will also give it more credibility in policy and, and narrow the gap, I think, between so-called climate science i.e. the natural scientists, and uh, climate social science. Although, of course, interdisciplinary uh, approaches are not simply a smooth process, I'd imagine that some natural scientists, because of the way in which they are trained to uh, be detached and so on and so forth, would possibly resist perspectives that question the status quo treatment of other animals. So that would be um, perhaps something that we might already be seeing um, through these kind of interdisciplinary approaches emerging. Okay, right, so I'm just gonna uh, finish where I began really with another quote by um, Ghosh, which I think is, is an interesting um, way to think about it. He, he talks about climate change as being uncanny, as, as throwing up lots of unsettling um, things. And you know, we can think of examples like um, the melting of the permafrost, potentially also introducing diseases that we thought we'd uh, seen the back of. So it kind of, climate change has a kind of uncanny um, mixing of temporality, but it also has an uncanny mixing of spatiality as well. If we think about insects traveling to, to new countries and potentially um, introducing new uh, rates of disease transmission in, in new spaces. And it also usurps, or if we want to take a slightly anthropomorphic view, which we might do from a literary perspective, it, it mocks the uh, modernist notion of the human as hyper-separated from the animal. And he says, he says in his book, so no other word comes close to expressing the strangeness of what is unfolding around us. He's talking about uncanniness. For these changes are not merely strange in the sense of being unknown or alien, their uncanniness lies precisely in the fact that in these encounters, we recognize something we had turned away from. That is to say, the presence and proximity of non-human interlocutors. Okay, so we've kind of denied those, those uh, interconnections, but we're being reminded of them by climate change. Okay. okay, so 
just to finish off really, so the sociology of climate change and sociology could be read as engaged in modes of concealment, that expression that we had at the, the very first um, quotation at the beginning of the presentation. So I'm not saying that there is climate denialism, there's obviously not, there's, uh, social scientists don't tend to take part in climate denialism. However, in excluding human-animal relations from the analysis, we could say that that is a form of denialism internal to the scientific consensus of anthropogenic climate change. And for sociology, we're talking about a 40-year failure to respond to the kind of ontoethical critique that we've seen from the sociology of human-animal relations. And, and uh, it's changing. Uh, we see more publications on human-animal relations in, in mainstream sociology journals, but it's to say that it's infiltrated and, and, and shaped and changed the whole discipline would be, would be to go too far. So uh, the reor reorientation I'm calling for here also presents an alternative sociological diagnosis of climate change. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with debates around the Anthropocene and also saying that actually we should call it the Capitalocene, uh, Jason Moore, for example. The basic criticism is to say that to use the term Anthropocene is too general and it's saying that uh, it's, it's saying that all of humanity is responsible for climate change. But uh, people like Jason Moore want to say that, well, actually, um, for, for him, that uh, we should actually say that this has come from capitalism and that to say that it's all of humanity is to gloss over the power relations that have been um, important for the emergence of climate change. Of course, I would say, coming from a slightly different perspective, that to, um, to only talk of capitalism is somewhat reductive and um, Gauche, for example, talks a lot about colonialism and empire in, in contributing to climate change. I would want to take this, the, to improve the intersectionality of understanding of climate change and to talk about uh, gender, class, speciesism, and also race, colonialism, and empire. Okay, so that, that's, that would be where I'm coming from, and it would be, I don't know, I don't think we could formulate a word <laughs> to replace these two necessarily, but uh, I think we need to be careful of uh, reductive explanations for um, climate change. Okay, so I really think that um, a sociology of climate change which um, excludes human-animal relations somewhat sells the discipline short in what it can contribute. Sociologists have skills in um, deconstructing social norms and I think that they are really necessary at this point in time. And also sociologists also have skills in thinking intersectionally as well. And I think that can be also an important uh, contribution in terms of thinking about these issues. Okay, so I'm gonna finish there and I'll just leave you with a, a couple of slides of uh, the works that I've cited during the presentation. And like I said, if you want a copy of either the paper or the PowerPoint, then just uh, drop me an email. It's my address at the bottom of that slide. Okay, thank you very much.